you're on the air with Florenza, your podcast destination for authentic conversations with a twist. So grab your favorite drink, get comfy, and join me on this unique literary journey. Cheers! And joining us today is Margot Harrison. She is the author of four young adult novels, including an Indies Introduced Pick, Junior Library Guild Selections, and Vermont Book Award Finalists. She grew up in New York and now lives in Vermont. The Midnight Club is her debut adult novel. You're able to find Margot on TikTok and Instagram at Margot F. Harrison. Thank you so much, Margo, for joining me on this episode of On the Air with Lorenza. And we are talking about your insanely good book, The Midnight Club. And right as we were coming on, I was reading the very last line. So if you could, please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your book, The Midnight Club, and why you chose now to release this book. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And I, I'm the author of four young adult novels. So this is my adult debut. And this is actually the first book that I ever started writing back in 1987 when I was in college. Um, so it took me 37 years to get it right. Apparently, <laughs> I was a little slow. <laughs> um, but this is a book about um, four Gen Xers, like people my age, who meet for a very exclusive college reunion in their old college town to remember their fifth friend who died before graduation. And one of them convinces the others that they should take a memory drug to find out what really happened to her. Like, did she really die the way they thought she did? Or could there have been foul play involved? Wow. And you know what? In my in my desperation to jump right in, I forgot to toast our show. So we're going to pause and toast to an amazing show. And you are drinking coffee, (laughs) coffee. So you're ready to get started. And those who listen already know what's in my my crystal flute. And it is a mimosa minus the juice. (laughs) So Cheers. That sounds good. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Now, the four friends, listen, I love well-developed characters. And I have to tell you, these four are so well-developed that each of them, you feel like they can take on an entire book series by themselves. So we have Sonia. Byron, Ara Lee, who for the listeners, that is spelled A-U-R-A-L-E-I-G-H. So Ara Lee, and we have Paul. These four individuals, again, like they are so unique in their characters. Which one came to you first and was just like, okay, I am here to stay? <laughs> You know, I think that was probably, well, the character who really came to me first was Hayworth, who's sort of like the love interest in this book, in this version of the book. But originally, he was the main character of the book. After that, I think it was Byron. Um, He was sort of the same character, the second character who came to me. Um, And Sonia is now really kind of the protagonist of the book. But she was the one who was hardest to work out because when I was younger, I I really had a hard time writing female characters, especially when they were a little bit like me. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to write about myself. I didn't want to reveal that much. So it was kind of a struggle. And I had to force myself to create that character and make her authentic. And that was going to be my question. Like, is there any one or culmination of characters that you would say is Margot, like you took bits and pieces of yourself and just kind of sprinkled them like glitter on the character. So that would be Sonia? Yes. I mean, I think there, there's always some of me in, in most of my characters. Um, Orly is probably the one who's least like me. 
Like she's like in the foil to Sonia, you know, uh -huh. she's really brash and confident and Sonia is shy and insecure, which uh, is, is more like me. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that she was the, she's sort of the, the character who is, reflects my own college experience. Okay. Now there is a term in the book, sog and sogging. And we're going to jump into what that is, but that is such an unusual word. Now, is there a meaning behind choosing that word to reference the um, drug that causes them the ability to go back in, in time? Um, SOG, it, it's interesting. I think that came to me a long time ago, but basically it's, I mean, this drug, it's not a drug that is made by big pharma. It doesn't officially exist. Scientists don't know about it. Nobody's formulating it. It's kind of like a folk remedy, something that people in this one area in Vermont are making out of pine pitch, which is like the sticky stuff from pine trees. Um, so it it's it's kind of still, it has the status of a legend almost. Um, and you have to be in the know to get any. So I, I thought it doesn't really have an official name, you know, like a, a real drug would have an official, a brand name, a chemical formula, but this just kind of has slang words that are used to describe it. Uh -huh. And SOG is used to describe it because when you take it, it makes you feel like you're floating in the water, like you're kind of waterlogged or, well, you go into a trance and when you come out of it, you feel waterlogged. Um, so it's almost like you're in a, you've been in a sensory deprivation tank or something. Nice. Now, I don't know if that's going to catch on or if people are going to be fl um, flooding, uh, flocking to Vermont to find all the pine trees. It's just going to be a massive reduction of pine trees trying to get this because it's, I think if there was like something I would want to go back in my past on, as I was reading the book, I kept questioning, like, would I want to go back, you know, in the past? And if I were to go back, what type of choices would I make? And I think the book does such a brilliant job of showing every scenario of what the reader would be thinking if they could go back. So, um, the Midnight Club, as we have said, reunites the four exchange um, college friends in a Vermont town to uncover the truth about their friend um, Jeanette's death. What inspired you to write the story and set it in Vermont? I know you started it when you were in college. And how does the setting influence the narrative? Um, the setting is a small Vermont college town, and it's based on a town that I moved to when I was 11 from New York City. I had been living in Manhattan, and I moved to this tiny town, huge culture shock. Um, and that that's what that's what also happened to Sonia in the book. So but and the town does have a college in it, but it's more of a sort of state college. I turned it into a very fancy red brick type of college, like, you know, literal, uh, like Ivy League type thing. Uh -huh. So um, so it's prestigious, but it's also out in the middle of nowhere, which is a little bit like the secret history. Um, and this setting, I mean, it's just such a big part of my life. I still live in Vermont, although not way out in rural Vermont. And it's just, um, this place has so much character. I mean, it's kind of, it's desolate. The people are not always friendly, although yeah. sometimes they are. It depends mm -hmm. on the setting. Um, it can be a very hard place to live, but it can also be a very beautiful place to live, especially in the fall, which is when I set this book because I wanted to have the leaves turning and Halloween and all of that fun stuff. Yes, awesome. Um, these characters, each with their own secrets and complexities, drive the narrative as they navigate their shared past and the mysterious circumstances of Jean, um, Jeanette's, Jeanette's death. When you were creating the story, did you already know that it would start with Jeanette? Are you like a plotter all the way through or did the story come to you in waves? as you just began to, to unravel the characters as they spoke to you? 
I have become a plotter later in my life, but when I first started writing this, when I was 19, I was not a plotter. It was just, yeah, it was like, oh, a character comes to me and this is the character's experience. This this character forgot a year of his life. Why did that happen? I mean, I had that in my head before, like, and, and I created the memory drug as a reason for his forgetting later. Um, so everything was backwards, nothing was planned. Okay. Um, and I had a version of this that was like 500 pages, another that was 700 pages. So learning to plot, I think, really helped, helped uh -huh. me make an actual story that people might want to read. <laughs> How drastically did the story itself change from that teenager starting to write it 15 years ago? Because you, you, it definitely had to be 15 years ago when you were 19. Uh, right. <laughs> and... <laughs> And the story that is about to be released, like how drastically of a change took place. It, it is completely changed because the original story was just about college students. Um, and there was, I think, a murder happening. There was some weird computer stuff happening because that was the 80s. And we were all kind of fascinated with that war game stuff. Yes. Um, but but the memory drug that came later and the fact that the characters are now middle-aged because mm -hmm. I'm middle-aged. So it, I kind of had to grow before I could write the story this way. And it became a story about middle-aged people looking back on the past and having regrets about the past. Mm -hmm. Now, can you share more about the development of these characters, um, particularly, well, we spoke a little bit about Sonia, but particularly about um, Ara Lee and Paul and how their secrets shape the dynamics of the group. Um, so Ara Lee invites the others to come to their college town where she has she has moved back there and bought a house and turned it into a B&B. &B. She's kind of in a midlife crisis, post-divorce, trying to remake her life. And her, her daughter is at the college there. So she wants to be close to her daughter. And um, but but the, but her friends think that maybe she's just a little bit unstable, like they're not sure that um, she knows what she's doing. And so she invites them here to take this memory drug. And she's like, I think our friend was murdered and I'm going to find out what really happened because orally. Well, Janet died in the river um, on the college campus. And Oralee was with her when it happened, but Oralee was drinking heavily and blacked out that night. So she did not, she had no memory of what actually happened. And they've always assumed that Janet either slipped or that she died by suicide because she was depressed. She had a history of depression. Um, but it's always possible that someone came in and, you know, did something and there's no way of knowing for sure. Um, so Orly thinks there's a, a, a secret here that the memory drug could perhaps reveal. What took place. Nice. Now, if the characters in the book were to find themselves on a reality TV show on, on an island somewhere, mm -hmm. who would win the grand prize and who would be most upset that they didn't win? <laughs> <laughs> the survivor oh, type reality show. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I think Oralee would absolutely win the grand prize. Well, if it if it was about social engineering, definitely, because she's the one who's the best at that. Uh -huh. um, the others are not, you know, well, Byron is like, he's a he's a nice guy. He gets along with all kinds of people. So he could probably do okay. And, you know, he's big and strong and could survive in that kind of environment. Um, Paul would absolutely not, absolutely not want to be there because he's like an intellectual, <laughs> hardcore, wants to be in the library, in the office, wouldn't want to have anything to do with pop culture or reality TV. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Sonia would definitely be very uncomfortable um, in that situation. So wait, so who would be who would be the most annoyed if they didn't win? You said, uh huh. Um, yeah. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Byron would be secretly annoyed because he he has um like he's he's very friendly, but he has sort of a dark side too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very good. 
if you could go back into any part of your past, if you had an opportunity to take some SOG and, and have a SOGging experience, where would you go and what would you hope to experience? Oh, that is a great question. I thought about this a lot, as you can probably imagine, because <laughs> um, I, I really would like to go back and experience my past and find out why things happened the way they did. Mm -hmm. I think I would want to go back to college. There are some part, some points in my childhood, too, I, like I would really like to see things from a more objective adult point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so when you take the drug, you're back, you're back in your, the body of being a child or whoever, but you still have your adult brain and um, the characters start to wonder at a certain point, can they control their younger body? Can they do things differently? Can they actually change the past? And I think I would be very tempted to do that because there were so many situations like when I was in high school and college where I think um, there were misunderstandings. I just like I was very shy, so I didn't express myself clearly. And now that I'm older, I can see that. Wow. How do you think that would change who you've become if you were able to make those changes? I I'd like to think that it would make me a more successful person in life, you know? Um, but I don't know. I mean, there's no way to know really. And uh -huh. I think part of the book is about being a, learning to accept that you are who you are, even if you're not always really happy with it. Um, I mean, I, I wish I had been like a, a socially adept person when I was younger, because I do feel like it, it kind of primes people for success if they're really good with other people, if they have a lot of friends, if they impress people. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I also have, I spent a lot of my life doing an academic degree that turned out not to be useful. So uh -huh. what I would I not do that if I went back? It would be really tempting, like yeah. use that time for something else. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's a great question for our listeners. And in the comments, I would love to read like what would, you know, the listeners go back in time to view again and, and possibly make that change. You did such a brilliant job of combining what are these sub genres into this one book you've got the um the thriller aspect you've got the suspense aspect you've got the romantic aspects you have the time travel aspect there are so many things going on within the book how did you manage bringing so much together without either one overpowering the main theme of the book Oh, well, thank you for saying that they work well together. I hope they do. Um, I mean, I think what I just really never thought about genre when I was writing this until much later when I had been published with other books. And then I, I knew that genre is really important. But I also knew that this book crosses genres. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it has different aspects. So I was talking about time travel and time paradoxes with my agent and editor who were not really in the science fiction field. I mean, I, I've read a lot of science fiction, so I'm kind of familiar with those concepts, but they were not as much. So I realized that I had to explain them in, in ways that were more clear. And I had to really focus on the emotions of the characters. And instead of kind of nerding out on the time travel aspect, um, which part of me might be tempted to do. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if you were working with editors that were more of that nerdy type with the time travel, that the theme of the book would have drastically changed, that it would have taken on more of a nerdy feel than that sweet blend of everything? I think so. Um, yeah, I think it, it could have been a very different book if it were more hardcore science fiction um, the romance definitely would not have been as much of an aspect. Mm -hmm. And I definitely chose at some point to bring the romance forward and to make that, I was like, well, why can't they be together? Because I think in earlier drafts, you know, that really didn't happen. Um, you know, why can't we have this little fantasy? Um, so that became more of a part of it. And I found that it was really fun to write. 
Yeah, it was excellent to read because the tensions were there and, you know, you're kind of rooting for different ones and then you would throw in a twist and it's like, oh, wait, hold up. Wait, no, I don't want them together. So it was it was great. I love it. I um, your book explores the gaps between who we are and who we hope to be. How do you think this theme resonates with the readers, especially those through the experiences of Janet, Janet? And um, what message do you hope they will take away from it? Um, I think I think a lot of us have had have felt that gap between the person we dreamed of being when we were in college and the person we turned out to be. And Janet dies when she is um, 20, 22. So she never experiences that gap. But clearly, as a college student, she was experiencing a lot of depression, a lot of fear of the future, which I think is something many college students do experience. So when we look at someone like Janet, who died early, we always wonder, like, what, what amazing things could she have done? I mean, I have a friend who was like that. Um, and I always wonder, like, who could she have been if mm -hmm. she had lived longer? Um, and then we have ourselves. And I think we judge ourselves for not living up to those dreams. But instead, maybe we need to accept who we are and sort of um, affirm ourselves and all the experiences that we've had and all the hard things that we've been through that made us who we are, even if it's not who we hoped, because you know, the dreams that college students have are not always realistic. Not at all. And as you were saying, some of the choices we make, if we can go back and it's like, oh my Lord, what were we thinking? Well, we probably weren't thinking. Our brains weren't developed yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> at all. Um, each character in the Midnight Club has secrets they are hiding. How do you how did you approach the development of Arlie's secret? And what do they reveal about just humanity, um, period? Um, you mean Oralee's secrets or from her friends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, she's, she's hoping to get a result from, um, from this reunion that, and she's not telling her friends everything that's going on or what she's doing, um, and is manipulating them just a little bit using things like a Ouija board, um, and the Halloween atmosphere. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think sometimes, um, People do kind of uh, manipulate each other, hoping to get to a deeper truth, but then mm -hmm. they find that they're tangled in their own lies and manipulations, and it ends up reflecting poorly on them. If, um, if Jeanette's ghost could communicate through a modern form of technology, such as social media, et cetera, being set more... Um, in this time, what do you think she would use? Which form of, of social media or communication might she use? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm. What would she use? I think it would be text-based. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Would she use threads? Maybe. I think she would. Maybe she would write um, cryptic little things on threads. I think it would be very like um, she wouldn't it wouldn't be obvious. It would be like a, a, a weird, mysterious little message. Um, cause, cause, cause Jenna was a poet and she wrote kind of weird poems. Like you have to, you, you, the, the meaning isn't really obvious. You have to look carefully into them. And she liked being mysterious, which I think was partly because of her own insecurity. Like she came from a poor family and went to this college with a lot of rich kids and mm -hmm. that was difficult. So she developed this kind of mystique around herself. And I see people doing that on social media, you know, on, on Twitter in the past and now uh -huh. more on threads, you know. Now, speaking of social media, you have a very active um, um, Snapchat, not Snapchat, is it? TikTok. No, TikTok. Mm -hmm. My friend, you are owning the TikTok space like, what drove you to TikTok and how did you develop 
your sweet little niche there because I got, I'm not like very much into TikTok, but I was completely lost in your entire um, page. Like it was so much fun. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Oh, well, it's, it is a very small niche, but um, I got on TikTok in 2021 because I heard that authors should be on TikTok and it was the best way to promote your book. And I, I was like, no, no way. I, I'm, I'm not doing that. Not in a million years. Uh -huh. like, how could I be on video? No. But I started doing it because my sister, she's actually a video professional. So she was putting her videos up there. Um, she told me that it was really easy. So I started doing it. I just played around with it. And I made this discovery that I loved it. <laughs> I really enjoyed like being on camera. Um, well, I actually started out just doing sort of like videos with books. Um, huh? And but then I got on camera more and I liked it. And I talked about my past and the books that I read when I was a kid. And people were interested in that. Awesome. Now, where are the listeners able to interact with you and to contact you and and to find out more about what you're doing not just with this book but future projects as well i have a website margoharrison.com and you can find me on instagram and tiktok um and threads at margo f as in frank harrison okay wonderful I know that you've been interviewed many times. Um, what's one question that you have never been asked that at the end of the interview, you always go, man, I was hoping someone would ask me. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Cause it kind of, um, it, it's different. It's depending on the book. Um, wow. What is a question? Um, well, I haven't been asked about the title of this book, or maybe I have. Yeah, tell us about the title. This book had many titles over its long life of different different drafts. Um, it started out being called World of Numbers, and then it was World of Warning, and then it was Memories Can't Wait, which is a line from a Talking Head song because I was I was really into the Talking Heads when I was younger, still am. Uh -huh. um, and then when it actually got bought by the publishing house, it became the Midnight Club, which is kind of a funny coincidence because just about a year or so ago, I did a bunch of videos about the Christopher Pike book, The Midnight Club, which was made into a Netflix series around that time. Um, so yeah, titles can't be copy copyrighted, but right. it was just kind of a coincidence that my editor wanted this title for this book. Um, and I, the Midnight Club by Christopher Pike is a great book too. I recommend that. Um, I hope they're both good. Awesome. And it does fit so well into the mystique and all of what was taking place in the story. So we have come to the part of our show that the, the listeners look forward to, and I call it this or that. I'm going to give you two options and then you just select the one that resonates the most with you. So, um, teleportation or time travel? <laughs> time travel. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you can tell. <laughs> Living in a tree house or on a houseboat? Oh, tree house. <laughs> tree house. Exploring outer space or the deep sea? Hmm. That's a hard one. I'm going to say deep sea. Nice. Having the ability to speak all languages or play all instruments, musical instruments. All languages, definitely. I love languages. And being able to control the weather or read minds. Oh, I'd like to be able to read minds, I think. Although the weather's the weather is not always great where I live, so that would be a good ability too. But yeah, I'll go with reading minds. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you so much, Margot, for spending time with us today. This has been fascinating. And um, oh, one question that I didn't ask you before we leave. What was the transition from YA to adult? That's a that's a big jump there. What, yeah. what prompted that? Yeah, I mean, well, I had always had this book sort of on the back burner, this adult book. Um, so I knew that I had that. But at a certain point, like I was trying to get published and I knew I couldn't do it with my draft of this book. 
So I started looking around at YA and I had story ideas that seemed like they fit the best in YA. That was like many years ago. Uh -huh. um, so I started writing YA and I've always been a huge fan of young adult books. That's what I talk about on TikTok. Um, so it was not that hard. I mean, I feel like my writing is not all that different when it's YA. Usually I do first person in YA. So that is uh -huh. a difference. But like, I try to write and assume that kids are smart and they can handle like complex characters. Um, and so it's, it's, it wasn't that big a jump for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And this was great. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for having me here. Oh, thank you for joining me. And this wraps up another episode of On the Air with Florenza. You may follow me on all social media platforms under Florenza Lee or via my website at Florenza.org. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>